Thank you. Um, so I was kind of in two minds about what to talk about when I started planning this session because firstly I want to talk about Doctor Who because I'm a massive Doctor Who nerd. Um, but secondly I thought maybe I'll slightly more serious and something that I think about a lot in my research which is about um, the creation of memory and evoking memory. Um, because my own research is about the use of colour in ancient sites and, um, and the way I'm moving towards that is the way that colour evokes certain behaviours and patterns <coughs> of behaviour um, because of the way it inspires us to behave based on folk and collective memories and various things wrapped up in that. Um, and the things that archaeology and science fiction both do is they, um, they create memories for us, memories of the past, memories of the future even, memories of places that haven't ever and will never exist. Um, but that bring about very like visceral reactions within us. Um, so I want to look at how um, that happens in science fiction, how that happens in archaeology, and how it sometimes happens sort of in a mixture between the two. So, um, so what do I mean when I talk about memory construction? Well, certain things that we read about, particularly within archaeology, um, it does this thing it evokes. So like, when we have an inter archaeological interpretation that's like something in the museum, or we go to visit a site that's got reproductions, or even when we're reading an archaeological site report, it evokes this imagery of what that particular past is being sold to us as, basically. And as you can see from some of the synonyms from evoke, it's a really powerful way of doing things. It summons, elicits, induce, that can be emotions and feelings. Um, it stimulates, stirs up, awaken, arouse. And sometimes that can be positive, so you can think about a past that you're being invoked to think of about the achievements they made, you can be thinking about the wonderful things that they've managed to do, the technology, the art and the culture. Um, but it can also obviously be used as a negative, and that's where you get things like slightly less savoury use of archaeological reconstructions, where people with certain agendas use them to evoke nationalistic feelings, or like right-wing, certain interpretations of, of ethnicity and that kind of thing. So the evocation of memory it's a very powerful tool and it's something that both archaeology and science fiction both do to sort of make the reader, the observer, the listener, um, to give us that, a sense of looking at humanity in slightly different ways. Um, possibly like the most, one of the most obvious ways that it's done, um, that's something quite recent obviously, is the poppy. Obviously it's meant to evoke a feeling of you know, this is a sacrifice, it's the past, the true like, terror of war, but it also unfortunately these days evokes a sense of, you know, nationalism and a sense of um, that you, you must do something, you know, you must wear it, and if you're not wearing it, why are you wearing it? So it also evokes a sense of um, responsibility, a sense of um, obligation, basically, and it's, it's, it's just one example of the way that um, things can be evoked, can have such a multiple multiplicity of the way it's viewed by people um, that can be completely divorced from the way it's originally meant to be evoked um, and the way it can just be used by many different people to do many different very powerful things um, and that's the thing that memory does um, it's a probably a very unique way that humans use memory obviously it's used memory is used in the animal kingdom remember where food is remember actions remember interactions but human memory is an incredibly powerful thing and I wanted to talk about one particular study that was done in um, 1974 by Loftus and Palmer about how the language that we use every day or that is used with us affects the memory um, and they had two participant groups in this study and they wanted to see how the language that was spoken to these people would affect their memory and basically they showed them a clip of a car crash and for part of the control group they used words like look at this smash look at this collision and for other half they used things like look at this bump look at this like incident that happened and the half that had the word smash said to them, they estimated the speed to be about 40, 45 miles an hour. And the group that had words like bump and you know, incident was just more like 30 miles an hour. So their memory of this event that they witnessed was shaped, even in the short term, just by this like, little bit of language that was used to them. And then even further, they took a group and said to them, this incident, did you notice any broken glass? And the group that had had this smash Yes, oh yeah, there's loads of broken glass everywhere. And then the group that had, like, just look at this incident, no, no broken glass, and there wasn't any broken glass. This memory of this crash, smash, you know, this, this evocation of this terrible incident um, was basically created just by the words that we use in this simple experiment. Um, and something that's, like, bandied about as a term for this on the internet these days, a very popular sort of trope, is called the Mandela effect. Um, and it was dubbed this in 2010 by Fiona Broom, who's a paranormal consultant, we'll use a polite term for it, 
Um, and it's talking about like the creation of false memories, especially in popular culture. Um, there's a particular um, thing where there's a children's TV series and book series called the Berenstein Bears in America. And basically that half the population the internet swears blindly used to be called the Berenstein Bears. And I had a book that said this on, this is how it's supposed to be spelled. So there's this like huge rift between people. And now I remember it this way and I remember it that way. And even in the face of photographic evidence of the books and of the TV series, they say, no, I remember it this way. It definitely was this way. And although there's some slightly wacky theories that say this is evidence of parallel universes, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually evidence of the way that the mind creates memories. Because something that you see in childhood, like a TV series, you cling on to that as a very powerful memory and you don't want to change that memory that's in your head. Um, so they, even when you're presented with later evidence that, no, it was this way, you then invent outlandish things like parallel world theories to try and explain to yourself in your head why it's not the way that you remember. So memory is a very powerful thing and when you evoke that to create a world that's unfamiliar yet familiar to people, it can be a really important tool. So what I want to briefly go through in this talk is how archaeology does this with memory. I will talk briefly about this program invasion. I'll try not to rant about it. Um, how science fiction does it with memory, probably obviously, most obviously in Philip K. Dick, who had this eternal struggle in his mind about his identity and memory and how this fed into the person he was. Um, and then about how science fiction and archaeology sort of combine. So I've used a couple of examples from literature about how themes of archaeology seep into science fiction and how they've been discussed and used. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about archaeology and memory. And uh, this is a series of archaeological interpretations. Um, it's in the Hunebed Centrum in Johnson, Netherlands. And basically, it's, if you're a stone nerd like me, it's amazing. It's a whole museum about stones. Um, and uh, they're particularly talking about the Hunebed, which is a type of passage grave in the Netherlands. Um, and they've got the biggest example in the county is basically at the back of the museum. And this is their sort of interpretation of how it's been through the years. So in the first one here is the ancients in use, as it were, and you've got some nice, like, deferential peasantish looking types bowing to this possibly woman here, who seems to be all in white and very holy, possibly. Uh, there's no words, really, with this. It's like, all based on your interpretation of what you're seeing. So they're letting your imagination wander. Um, and then you've got when this, like, nice farmer comes and says, I fancy some rocks for my field. Let's dig up this thing. Here he is, you know, with his sleeves rolled up, getting to work, making some stones. Um, and then at the bottom you get sort of the romantic period where people came and were inspired to write poetry and read some books to their sweethearts here and it's all very genteel and lovely. Uh, and then the archaeologists come and destroyed it like we do. Um, but each one of these is sort of evoking a different set of memories. You've got this spiritualism of the past where the, the past can only be some kind of like wonder, they were so high and like spiritual and look at how like clean and wonderful they are, which I'm quite sure is probably not accurate. Um, and about you know this like very holy figure here. It's a, it's a very strange like concept they're building up already in your mind. And then um, and then you get to like the archaeological phase. It's like look how how precise they're doing everything. How neat these like the details of spoil are here. This is in the twenties, so I doubt it was this neat. Um, but that's just the way that without words and without a guiding context. They're, using, they're still using imagery that triggers that, like a memory focus in us. We're thinking of folk memories of farmers taking stones. We're thinking of um, like romantic poetry because we're familiar with these concepts. So they've, they've built these like little, little dioramas, but they've used references that are familiar to us, so it evokes a trigger in our mind. So instead of building a prehistoric thing up here and trying to be a bit out there and use some more alternative interpretations, or to use some of the more interesting theoretical interpretations of the past, they've gone something quite clean and quite basic that it instantly triggers the viewer, oh, this here's some ancient people doing their ancient gubbins here. Um, but it doesn't really push to go beyond that. It's a very safe memory that they're evoking here. Um, and this is when I come back to the programme Invasion that was on recently. I've not been allowed to watch it in my house because I get a bit shouty. Um, but basically, they've, they've gone back to sort of a... I don't know where to put it, they've gone back to a sort of very traditionalist way, let's say, of interpreting the way that various peoples have come into the British Isles and settled here. So they've gone with the inflammatorized invasion to start off with. Um, and then they've done very, like, very almost 1950s attitude to, and people came over here and they conquered and they this and they brought their swords over here and then every thought swords were amazing and this sort of thing. And here's some like shouty reenactors and things. And they've built on these sort of, 
very traditionalist views of the way British history has developed. And it's very dangerous to take that kind of narrative in a time when there are groups who want to use things like British history in a way that makes it seem like immigrants bad, you know, white, white British good, you know. And it's, it's unwittingly, I presume, feeding into that, that kind of very like, awkward Brexit narrative of the way that immigration population shifts move. And um, it's, it's evoking a memory of a time when Britain was great and isn't Britain wonderful? And it's a very dangerous narrative to take. And that memory evocation is something that archaeologists really need to think carefully about. You know, when we create reports or when we create interpretations, those interpretations have an afterlife. And it's kind of our responsibility to then take that interpretation and challenge misuse of it and to challenge the way people use it, possibly not as we would. Uh, I know archaeologists who are consultants on these theories and they, they, they've ignored what we said to them. They haven't listened to our narratives. They haven't listened to the way we've told them that these procedures worked. They've just gone with what they wanted to talk about based on the TV series. So it's important to stand up and say, no, here's an alternative. Um, you know, to, to evoke a different kind of memory within people. Um, and one, the, I, I basically re recommend this paper to everybody I speak to these days, which is a uh, it's really fantastic recent paper by uh, Payden, and he talks about how heritage can be used by local communities to sort of fight against um, <coughs> narratives, especially against the things like uh, he uses examples in Turkey where the government tried to force certain nationalistic narratives on heritage, and he basically argues against that. So here's how local communities can reclaim their local heritage; they can reclaim their identities. Um, and fight against the narrative and provide alternatives, evoke new memories that are much more positive, that foster much better um, alternatives. So how does science fiction do the same sort of thing? Because obviously it doesn't, well, it sometimes talks about the past, but more often it talks about the future or a very close to the future present. Um, but it's still, I'd say, it's still evoking a memory because it's evoking an imagery of humankind that's, it's divorced from our own because obviously if it was exactly the same, we'd know how they behave. But it's very close and we can recognise that their motives within it. And uh, as I put in my abstract, a quote from 1984, whoever um, controls the past controls the future, whoever controls the present controls the past. And in 1984, you've obviously got this huge cult of personality of Big Brother, um, where collective memory and history is being massively rewritten and erased and changed. Um, whole scale basically um, and it's, it's, it's manufacturing a memory of you know Big, Big Brother and his associate government has always been great look at our achievements it's manufacturing a memory of their past as being glorious and nothing's ever been different to that and don't you and here is the evidence to back it up behind it um, so Orwell's sort of using the way they're evoking the memories as a way to say memory can control people and, and memory can control the way society develops. And it's very much entangled with the way that he's, they're also changing the language. Language and memory are very closely linked. Um, and obviously within 1984, they're redacting language to make it difficult to even think differently to the way you can. Um, and perhaps a bit more uh, recently and easy for people to get into is obviously Blade Runner and the um, follow up Blade Runner 24 to now, which I thought was an absolutely um, incredible example of the way to discuss memory and how memory shapes. I'm not going to give you too many spoilers, don't worry. Um, the way memory shapes sort of um, our fate and the way we interact with the world. Um, because obviously for the replicants, their memory is literally created, it's designed by their programmers. Um, and they sort of recognise this, but they still interact with the world in human ways and they sometimes strive to be more human than human. Um, and the way I think of it as, <clears throat> as an archaeologist is, can we then use this as a mirror for our own actions? When we create memory states for people to look about archaeology, what's our goals in that? What are we trying to evoke when we create those memories and sort of put them into people? Um, we're trying to inform them, but inform them of what? Of our own biases, of our own interpretations, or of a genuine past that we're trying to recreate? Um, how does like the memories that we create of this past affect how they go forward into the world and how they now interpret things that they see around them? How maybe they lead politically? How maybe they interpret different sites themselves? So to what effect do the memories that we create as archaeologists and reconstruct them, how does that affect both our path and the path of people that are reading and taking those in? Um, and within Blader, obviously, the memory identity and trying not to spoil the most recent, but um, basically the memories that we ha they have 
they entwine very closely with how they perceive their destiny should play out um, and their actions should be and what they should achieve as an individual. Um, and how closely is that linked to, as archaeologists, how the memories of the past that we create, how is that connected to modern cultures? Does it in, inform how then they interact, how they develop artistically, how they develop the social interactions that they do? Thank you. So how do archaeologists and which sort of blend together? I've chosen a couple of literary <coughs> examples. Um, this book, Inferior, by Jack Vance in the 1960s. Uh, Jack Vance is an absolutely superb author. If you haven't read any of his books, I definitely recommend it. He's a superlative world builder and sucks you in absolutely immediately to the universe he creates. Um, in this, this is a standalone novel, nice and short, nice, quick, <coughs> crisp, not particularly festive Christmas tree, a little bit gory again. Um, but basically, there's a primitive society in here um, that have settled on this world, and they're completely ruled over by an aristocratic caste that basically gets them to produce lots of rich heritage, craft, and art, as in pictures it's on at a great profit. Um, and then one character, the hero, managed to escape this system and find that this art is vastly venerated around the galaxy. It's in um, great galleries everywhere, it's, it's hoarded by people, um, and he only changes the fate of his people when he finds out the true history of this like folk hero. Basically, they're completely kept in line by the aristocrats, by this folk story that they need to follow this path, they need to create art, they need to be cowed. But when he finds the true story of Inferior, and again, even though it's going to stick to what's spoiling in case you want to read it, um, when he finds the true history of Inferior and what that is, it actually leads to a great social change. So changing the folk memory and evoking a different, more triumphant story um, leads to a different way in which their heritage and folk is perceived and leads them to a success. Um, and I spotted this in Colin's side earlier, but can't still believe which, again, is very closely entwined with history and archaeology and the way that affects um, the cyclical history of people. Basically, again, it's post-apocalyptic world, and this order of the Leibowitz, they basically excavate and preserve what they perceive to be scientific knowledge. It's, it's everything basically like shopping lists, like people's like diaries and everything. They don't, because mainly knowledge has been lost, so they just like get all knowledge in, which is just completely mundane. Um, but then that leads to a system like folk artifacts uh, being kept, and like things like blueprints are translated into beautiful illuminated manuscripts like you would see in the monastery. Um, but throughout it's the concept of like these like have now become the new folk memories, but it's done us no good because history still cycles and repeats itself because they haven't broken the mould of the you know, in evoking these memories of once it was great, but that's all it is, it's just encapsulated as past greatness. It hasn't translated into future change. So it, it really highlights the danger of evoking a memory but then leaving it trapped in hands and doing nothing with it before. Um, so uh, very recently, I'm very well, I'm going quickly out of time. Um, I think you can basically, you can use science fiction as a great sandbox for archaeological theory, a way of expanding the way you think about it. And then we have touched about on this really this morning, how you can use science fiction as a lens to future-proof heritage and to future-proof the way you preserve things for the future. But it's also a really good way of as, as thinking about some sort of mind-opening questions. Now this is San Junipero, which is quite recent. Um, and in this particular episode of Black Mirror, um, basically there's a, an artificial world where your consciousness can go into temporarily if you want to, or permanently when you die, you can be transferred into here, or at least a version of you. Um, so what if you use this sort of self-contained artificial world to ask yourself some questions as an archaeologist, ranging from the sort of very basic questions like, if you're an archaeologist in this digital world, well, what would you dig up? What, what's there? Who's programmed? What's there? Do the people coming in bring artifacts with them? And how do you curate an exhibit to reference these things? But then think about, well, if you're a resident in this world, how do you conceptualise time when time is basically standing still? How do you think about death and decay when they don't happen anymore? Uh, and then as an anthropologist or archaeologist, how can then you look at a society like that and use it to understand cultures with completely different concepts to our own of how time passes and how death occurs? Um, how can that give us a, a refreshing way of looking at completely different mindsets. So science fiction can act as like a sounding board for like different ways of seeing the world, basically. And I wanted to close with a quote by Philip K. Dick, a man who struggled a great deal with ideas of memory and identity. And he said that today we live in a society which spurious realities are manufactured by the media, by governments, by big corporations, by religious groups, political groups. So I ask in my writing, what is real? Because unceasingly we are bombarded with pseudo realities manufactured by very sophisticated people using very sophisticated electronic mechanisms. I do not distrust their motives, I distrust their power, and they have a lot of it. 
It is an astonishing power, that of creating whole universes, the universe of the mind. I ought to know I do the same thing. And I think as I told us, we do the same thing too. We create entire universes of a past that we want people to believe in and understand, but are completely coloured by so many facts of our own biases, of social um, effects on us, and we need to recognise that we are making a, basically a science fiction world of our own devising. Thank you very much. Thank you.